email, and we have had some email hiccups the last couple of days. So if you would like these slides and weren't able to get them, I'll also make sure that I can provide those to you as well. Uh, my name is Graham McCarty. I'm a local foods and small farms systems educator, and this is the third of our Get Growing series. Um, for the last couple of weeks, we have been covering the backyard orchard, basics of soil science and soil management. And now we get to a topic that everyone is usually very excited to hear more and more about, which is tomatoes, peppers, as well as eggplant, we'll talk about today. This presentation has been delivered in person before, and I've tried to adapt it to the Zoom features. And so there may be a couple of hiccups today, especially when it comes to talking about trellising and staking your tomatoes, which is much more easier to, to do in person sometimes. But otherwise, we're gonna to try to adapt and kind of move forward with this, uh, with this topic that you see here. I have had a very long experience with tomatoes. Uh, my grandparents in Tennessee grew 100 tomato plants every year, and these were grown for preserving and for canning. My undergraduate and graduate work is in tomato and pepper production. And I had two years where I grew 200 tomato plants and 500 pepper plants out in the fields and graded them and harvested them and dealt with wonderful diseases. And then in my personal experience in the growing in the Midwest, I have been growing them for the last seven years. Lots of different heirloom, open pollinated hybrid varieties and cultivars which we'll talk about today. So I, I love tomatoes, I love peppers, and if you've gone through some of my Master Gardener classes before, you've heard me spend sometimes way more time on, on both of these than sometimes they need to. So thanks for joining us today. If you are new to our, our program, uh, I wanna give you a little bit of an overview of who I am. I am up in Northern Illinois, so I'm in Joe Davis, Stevenson, and Winnebago counties. These are in the Freeport, Rockford area. All three counties touch the Wisconsin state line. My area of focus is in soil management. It's in commercial and non-commercial fruits and vegetables, which is backyard production, um, community garden production. I do a lot of work in insects and disease management, and I also do a lot of work in fruit tree pruning. Today, I want to also mention that I am in planting zone 5B. I know that there are some folks in central as well as southern Illinois that have joined us, as well as folks from other states as well. And what this means is that our last spring frost is around mid-May. So you may be in an advantage to be able to plant your tomatoes and peppers much earlier than we are. In fact, I'm looking out my window to about four to five inches of snow that is still coming down. So this week especially, it is very clear that I am in planting zone 5B, but recognize that you may be in a very different one. Today's plan will get into the general setup of thinking about tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant, thinking of the different types that are out there. What are some things that you need to consider when it comes to selecting these different varieties and cultivars um, that are out there for you. Um, and then we'll get more into kind of the kind of planting basics of, of what these are and what these really look like. And some of the other things you'll have to kind of consider uh, during that time period. I'll spend some time thinking about the trellising and the staking of tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants as this is really crucial when it comes to sometimes the overall productivity of the plants that you're gonna be growing. And then it's one thing to actually plant these. It's another thing to actually deal with some of those seasonal management issues, the insects and the diseases, which can be very destructive when it comes to growing these, as well as getting to some of those physical disorders. What are some of those imperfections that we see when it comes to growing them? They're not necessarily a disease, it's just as something that's a little bit off about them and their appearance. And I wanna share that with you so you don't worry too much about what you might be dealing with. We'll get into a lot of environmental issues too. Some of the things that we have noticed in Northern Illinois and other parts of the state when it comes to growing them. What is the reaction of say, a very colder than usual July? or lots of rain that we sometimes have seen the last couple of years in June. And then finally getting to some harvest. 
whenever I think about my vegetable garden, I tend to also think about what grew well last year. I tend to keep a diary and kind of take notes of what happened, as well as take lots of photos. I also tend to think <laughs> what didn't grow well last year. And sometimes I find that it is just an off year when it comes to vegetables and when it comes to tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant. Because we have some time before you're gonna be planting these, this is probably a good time to really be reflective and, and really think more and more about what grew well and really what didn't grow well. Also consider maybe some disease problems you might have had and maybe how you might do that differently this upcoming season. Consider too how you're growing your plants, your trellising, your soil amendments, and also thinking you know, before and during the season, as you prepare to select your cultivars and varieties and plant them, but also how did they happen throughout and the end of the season. And this guidance is pretty true for any kind of vegetables you might be growing. Today I will talk about this pepper that you see here. This is um, the, uh, I don't, it's not the Trinidad scorpion, um, it is one of those other hot peppers. I, the name escapes me right now, but we'll get around to it. And we grew this one two years ago, and it was a very prolific pepper, but also a very hot pepper. When I think about new cultivars and new varieties that I'm gonna grow this season, I always like to ask people what they grew and what did they like. But one of the main questions that I ask is, what did you grow that you hated? What performed terribly for you? What would you never again wanna to devote to your garden space? It's a weird question to ask, I recognize, and yet I get a lot more feedback and a lot more passionate uh, growers and gardeners when it comes to asking what did you grow that you didn't like. And that can guide me when it comes to deciding on new things. One of the other resources I've shared previously in, in this webinar series is the Seed for the Kitchen Collaborative. It is a program through the University of Wisconsin where they are trying out new different cultivars of peppers and tomatoes, seeing how they perform in a kitchen space with chefs in the Madison, Wisconsin area, as well as community gardens and market growers that sell at farmer's markets. I will send you an email later today that has links to both those topics when it comes to peppers and the tomatoes. Other things to look at, you know, the growing features, the height, the width, the size, the shape of tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant. Certainly the taste and the texture can sometimes be a good choice to consider when it comes to what your uses of them are going to be. And sometimes that generic point of, is it a sweet pepper versus a hot pepper? And I know that's a very simplistic way of thinking about it. And yet it may mean that you have a great pepper season or it may be that you're growing a pepper that's much hotter than you really wanted it to be. I find it's also important to know how it'd be used. Is it going to be fresh eating? Is it going to be a sauce? Is it going to be canned? Is it going to be dried like some of the peppers may be? When we grow tomatoes in our backyard and in other community spaces, my main goal is fresh eating. I love a, a tomato sandwich. And so the tomatoes that I am choosing have more water quality and water content in them because they're gonna be fresh eating. They would do very poorly when it comes to actually preserving and canning. When it comes to tomatoes, there is a wide range of different uses, shapes, colors, and textures. And you see as you look through catalogs and websites that it is very overwhelming with all the cultivars and varieties that are out there. One of the main choices you're going to need to make, which we'll talk about today, is whether it's going to be a determinate or an indeterminate type of tomato. Because that will then determine how you space your tomatoes, how you trellis your tomatoes, how you harvest your tomatoes sometimes. And it may also determine whether it's going to be a fun season for you with lots of overgrown tomatoes that you made the choice of, of growing, or maybe they're small and compact like a determinant and it's a little bit easier. I also always encourage looking towards disease resistance, which yet again, we'll talk a little bit more today about as we go along. There's a wonderful resource book called Epic Tomatoes by Eric Lehollier, and he was with Seed Savers Exchange uh, in Iowa, and he does a lot of work in tomato production now. 
And it's a beautiful book. I would just highly recommend that book when it comes to growing tomatoes because it gives a lot of guidance as well as suggestions of different cultivars and varieties and can help a lot when it comes to troubleshooting. So you can find that, that resource pretty affordable. And I, it's one of my great ones I now have in my gardening library home. So with determinate and indeterminate, both of these words will be used quite often today. And I also want to recognize that they can also have different names as well. So when I say determinate, you may also see that heard as a hybrid tomato. And what happens here is that it's gonna reach a set height. It does not need any pruning, any kind of sucker removal. They tend to be a little bit better for canning and preserving in most cases due to their stature and their height. Sometimes when you think about that very traditional red globe looking tomato, we tend to think a lot of that determinant. But know that that name determinant and hybrid will go back and forth uh, throughout today. I try to mention them at the most at the same time. The other word you'll hear a lot today about tomatoes is indeterminate. So these also go by open pollinated. They also will go by that heirloom name as well. Heirloom is usually meaning that it has some kind of story or some kind of history connected to it. These tend to continue to grow. I, I've had growers ask before, well, how tall will my indeterminate Cherokee purple tree plant grow? And, and sometimes the best guess is just as long as they're happy and they're getting sometimes everything you need, you may have not a tomato plant, but a tomato tree. So you may have that tomato forest in the backyard much more. And they may need sucker removal is needed. I'll show you a photo of what that looks like. In a lot of cases, an indeterminate type is going to have better flavor. It's going to be better for fresh eating. It may also be more prone to some of those disease issues that we see in tomato production um, as well. So it can just kind of depend uh, with it as you look more into deciding what cultivars and varieties that you want to grow. But both of those are very crucial. You have this slide set, so it lists a number of different cultivars out there. And I've tried to break these up into different types as far as their uses, such as a slicer, a paste, or a canning. Slicer tends to be something that is going to be a little bit better for that fresh eating style. But I've also tried to include things related to color and so forth. I'm not gonna read every single one of these, but I just wanna highlight a couple of them that are very common, that come with lots of great recommendations. One of the newer ones that I have encountered and, and taste tested this past fall is the Italian heirloom. And in teaching a master gardener class in Joe Davis County this past fall, we had a very small tomato taste off. And Italian heirloom uh, came away as a very highly regarded tomato flavor-wise. I've also heard folks that will use it in canning and preserving and sauces, and I've also been very pleased with it. So this cultivar could act as both your fresh eating as well as potentially preserving um, and making the sauces and so forth. You'll see a lot of canning tomatoes on the market, like Celebrity or an Early Girl. Um, Cherokee Purple is one that I grow every year and really like the flavor of it. You see a photo of Cherokee purple here at the side uh, with it. I grew last summer pink Berkeley tie dye. I am a orange tomato guy. I really like orange tomatoes. And the one that I tend to have in my backyard every year is Valencia. It's a very beautiful orange tomato, a good solid size uh, tomato. And I use it mostly for uh, fresh eating. Although I do tend to see it sometimes used in sauces. Uh, but, you know, if you're looking to maybe expand your palate and expand some of your tomatoes in the backyard, look towards some of the orange and yellow ones because they can give you a much different flavor than some of those traditional red, purple, and black ones do. In thinking about tomatoes, you're going to see a lot of information about disease resistance. This can include peppers. Peppers may also have some disease resistance in there as well. Um, but we see it more often than not with tomatoes. This is something that we do commonly recommend. If you were to grow 
four or five different cultivars or varieties of tomatoes in the backyard, we would like you to have at least one or two that has some disease resistance, just in case disease pops up in that season and takes out many crops that might have not been resistant, you at least have maybe one or two that had some form of resistance. While they may get a little bit of infection, we don't necessarily see them being like full force kind of destruction, if you will. You will see in many guides, these codes listed here. Um, some of the very common ones that I get concerned with in our area is Verticillium and Fusarium and Fusarium wilt, both of which I'll show you a photo of uh, as we get to the disease section today. We also deal with early blight and late blight on sometimes a seasonal basis, and both of those would be ones to look towards. And what this may mean is that if I am choosing, say, the early girl cultivar of, of tomato, it is known to have verticillium and fusarium wilt resistance. So while my Valencia or my Cherokee purple might be hit really hard with those diseases this summer, early girl should be able to survive and be able to make it. One other thing you might see is the mountain varieties. You will see things like mountain merit or, or other ones, and that usually denotes some resistance. But yet again, aim for a mix as much as you can here. You know, don't just fully go out with the heirlooms or open pollinated ones. Try to find some that have a bit of disease resistance if you can. For peppers, this is shapes, this is sizes, this is heat. And yes, there may be some great disease resistance in there. In our Northern Illinois climate and our planting zone, I do encourage folks to consider that date to maturity. There's a number of pepper cultivars out there that can take upwards of over 100 days to actually yield when it comes to planting. And due to some of the noticeable environmental issues we've had in the last couple of years, look towards a variety that maybe is a little bit earlier as far as its yield. So this may be that instead of that pepper that may take 100, 110 days to mature and yield for you, look toward the one that maybe is 85 or 90 days if you can. I just find that the weather is, uh, is hitting us really hard, especially some of these seasons. The other thing you might look at is the Scoville range, and this is a measurement of the capacian level within the actual pepper itself, and it is this heat range for peppers. So if you love some of those very hot, hot peppers, you might look at this range to see, you know, what this measurement is. A sweet bell is typically classified as a zero versus, say, a jalapeno, which is 3,500 to 8,000. That should be 8,000, not 800. We have grown the ghost chili pepper for the last couple of years in our Rockford garden. And I grew it just out of curiosity to see how it would perform. Um, I like heat, but I don't like too much heat. What I found in growing this pepper is very prolific. We were getting between 35 and 40 of these peppers on a single plant, which if you have grown ghost chili peppers or you like very hot peppers, that may be all you need <laughs> as far as the peppers for that season. It can be very prolific, at least that's what we really found in anecdotally growing this pepper. Another very, very hot pepper is Carolina Reaper, and you see the Scoville scale is much, much greater than that ghost chili pepper on the previous slide. Um, excuse me, we're up to about 1.5 million on that Scoville average range. And when you think of that bell pepper at a zero and then classify this all the way at the end, it's a, it's a pretty wide range of that, uh, that heat level. As mentioned, there's kind of these two broad types. You've got your sweet, you've got your hot peppers, both of which then get back somewhat to the actual shape of the peppers that you, that you find. Many of the cultivars that are listed here are coming from University of Illinois Extension and some of our recommendations. This information is also coming from that Seed Kitchen Collaborative from University of Wisconsin, as I mentioned to you as well. You'll find lots of different colors in that bell pepper category. Know that sometimes that flavor doesn't really come across as anything different. The purple bell, for instance, yes, it's a beautiful purple looking 
bell pepper, and yet the flavor I find tends to be very similar to just a standard green pepper. Unfortunately, a chocolate bell pepper is not going to taste like chocolate. So I figure you know that, but just yet again reiterating. You will find a wide range of hot peppers as well. And many of the ones listed here are kind of those primary red colorations that you see here. I want to include eggplant today because it is one of those kind of other ones to really mention when it comes to thinking about tomatoes and peppers. It is one that's fairly compact. It really thrives in that summer heat. And so it is one that if you were thinking of planting eggplant, you might push back your planting date in Northern Illinois, closer to that first week of June, just because it may not make much sense to plant it out towards the end of May, um, compared to when our tomatoes and peppers might be going out. There's a number of cultivars on the market that have that kind of central kind of Italian globe appearance to it, as well as those traditional eggplant that are out there. For the last couple of summers, I have grown um, very small eggplant. The fairy tale eggplant is the one that you see here in this photo. And I've grown it in containers the last couple of years. I've been pretty pleased with its performance. The actual uh, yield height tends to be about the length of your index finger in most cases. And it's a very prolific producer, and you can see lots of flowers on this eggplant. But yet again, it's not gonna produce that abundance amount when it comes to those other standard eggplants. Gretel and Hansel are also two other smaller types of cultivars and varieties. Most eggplant does not store too well, so just kind of keep that in mind that you may find it just doesn't store as much as you'd like it to. One of the main challenges in growing eggplant is feed flea beetles, and you will find that they will just kind of cover the leaves depending on the season. Typically, this is one where a row cover over the plant could provide some protection, and yet again, we want to do it before flowering to, to help with that. There's also going to be a number of other different types of eggplants out there, and many of these are going to be related back to your cooking plants. You know, you will find Thai eggplant, which is very, very small, minute ones that almost look like a golf ball, if you will, when it comes to cooking. You'll see Chinese, Japanese eggplants, so these very long, narrow eggplant shapes that are very prolific producers, and yet a very different shape than what you will find um, mostly at, at home and garden centers sometimes. You'll also see Indian and baby eggplant, very tiny eggplant, which is here in the photo is the Indian baby eggplant. And there can also be white and green eggplant that may have a bit more of a different creamier texture than that traditional eggplant has. It's important to recognize that sometimes the flavor can be the same, it's just the shape and the use may be a little bit different when it comes to these types. You may also find that you need to order the um, eggplant seeds for some of these more unusual ones and really start those seeds indoors. This summer we'll be growing uh, a Thai eggplant as well as, I think I ordered Moneymaker, which is, oh, what a name, Moneymaker eggplant. So both of those, the seeds should be coming soon and I'll start the seeds indoors before planting the end of the season. Let's get into some planting basics now. Uh, you know, I think we were very eager a couple weeks ago to maybe thinking, oh, I'm gonna be able to get my tomatoes and peppers in much earlier than usual. And yet, as I look at four or five inches of snow right now, um, I, I think we're probably still gonna be doing it as, as planned. So typically we plant towards the end of May uh, in Northern Illinois in this 5B, 5A zone. This tends to be the week before Memorial Day weekend. That tends to be what I, I notice when it comes to planting. You may be able to get yours out much sooner if you are in other parts of the state. I know for a lot of folks, May 15th tends to be kind of that day when it comes to planting. For security's sake, I tend to wait a good week after that May 15th date, which tends to be about the week before Memorial Day weekend. What I notice is sometimes the evening temperatures are in the 40s and 50s. And while tomatoes and peppers can tolerate these temperatures, um, you know, they're not too happy. And I would say you would be fine waiting a little bit closer towards the end of May. 
especially if you purchase them as transplants. If you decide today that you are going to start seeds, I think you are at an advantage to actually have a good, good five weeks of good growth. So while you may not get that very tall looking type of tomato plant that you may find at a home and garden center, I think you could certainly get five, six weeks of good growth before planting, especially if you got all the seed starting equipment that you needed uh, this weekend. In most cases, spacing tends to be tomatoes of about 24 to 36 inches. If you were growing heirloom tomatoes, I would go more towards that 36 inches, just knowing what the spacing can look like on those versus a determinate tomato that might be 24, four inches, maybe a little bit less. Peppers, I tend to think about a foot and a half uh, or 18 inches. 15 inches between rows is also doable for peppers and you can do some kind of trellising kind of box system to support them. Eggplant needs to be about 18 to 24 inches in spacing too. And know that this is down a single row and this is also a row over. I think you can get a little bit tighter when it comes to between rows, and yet I still encourage you to be kind of mindful, you know, especially when it comes to these uh, warm season crops that will potentially take over parts of your garden, especially if they're spaced too close together. Another idea with this spacing is that it does allow for much better airflow, which is crucial when it comes to disease management, is making sure that the leaves of my plants are drying out and having good airflow and spacing is really what you're after here. If you're purchasing transplants, of course we want to recommend a reputable nursery and home and garden center. And I have found that those in my area have adapted to kind of our current situation and are doing um, phone orders and pickups and drop-offs. Keep in mind that there are also a number of farmers market vendors that have started their tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants. And this may be a great time to reach out to them and purchase some of these uniquer varieties that you may be unable to find. I do both. I will start some vegetable, tomato, and pepper seeds indoors as transplants but then I will also purchase my transplants from home and garden centers too. I find that I can easily get Cherokee purple tomato plants quite often versus some of those other ones that are a little bit harder to find that I have to start indoors. I think it's especially crucial right now to reach out sooner than later, especially as you think about getting closer to that planting date um, towards the end of May with this. I usually encourage you to avoid flowering transplants what we sometimes see is that if you are purchasing a transplant and it has already started to flower and then you plant it into the soil, you may find that it takes a little bit of time for it to kind of get adjusted to its new environment. Because really those first initial weeks of transplant are to encourage the plant to, to grow and to get vigorous in height and stature and not necessarily to focus so much on the flowering side of, of that. Look to examine the leaf tissue for any diseases or insects. You'll see photos of what both of those look like today. And this may be one effort to consider. Occasionally folks will purchase a transplant that has insect or disease severity, and that tends to be um, where we actually see the disease come into your garden. It was not that you necessarily did anything wrong or it came from another backyard. It could be that the transplant had both of those symptoms. What about late plantings? I think that's especially something we get lots of questions about in Northern Illinois is that sometimes we just can't get enough of those tomatoes, right? And you could do a late planting later on in midsummer, uh, kind of playing around with that first frost date. In Northern Illinois, the average first fall frost is around October 4th. Although I know a number of you all in other parts of the state, this may be towards the end of October and potentially you know, into the first week of November. In most cases, you know, from seed to actual yield, we may look around 104 days. That's really sometimes what you're after. As shared with you, tomatoes and peppers can tolerate the 40s and 50s Fahrenheit, but it's the 30s Fahrenheit that is, is the main problem you will actually see some, some damage on your tomato and pepper plants when you're getting to that period of 30 degree Fahrenheit air temperatures. 
There's also some thought of what's called a topping off period. So for instance, if you are still growing the same tomato plant from May when you planted them, and now it's that first or second week of September, and you're recognizing that we're getting closer to that frost date, you might find that main growth epical stem of where a tomato is and actually cut it off. And that should kind of trigger the plant to actually start shutting down. So it's not going to necessarily start creating new flowers to get pollinated, but it will begin to kind of shut down that process of the tomato and hopefully focus more on the actual tomatoes that are on the plant starting to develop and starting to, to yield for you. I've done this a couple of times. I've not always been pleased with the results on this situation, so it may be something to experiment with. Tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant could also all thrive in containers. And I think that that is what I've tried to do the last couple of years, is actually experiment with containers and see how the plants react and how they do. Now in my situation, I use five gallon buckets. I find it's the easiest for me to get. It can make the most sense when it comes to moving around in different areas of my garden. You may find that you have a much better grasp of this and a better situation when it comes to your containers. I still encourage you to think about at least eight inches of depth, and I think it's especially gonna be crucial to consider what types of tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant you want to grow. Many of those determinate varieties can do great in the container. You will see things such as patio or lunchbox peppers listed as, as good varieties. That fairy tale, Hansel, Gretel, eggplant, have also done very well with, within the situation. When it comes to that growing media, you want to look towards potentially a raised bed container mix, but also look to, you may, may decide to make your own. So the soil is media of perlite or vermiculite to help address um, water and air intake, looking at compost as well, and of course having some fertilizer and fertility needs. If you're making your own, you know, you need to drill holes at the bottom. You need to make sure that you're having some water that will leave it. Yet again, avoid garden soil in this situation just because it's not going to perform the way you want it to perform. And then long term, you might look at trellising, sunlight. You may need to address drying, drying out, some of the situations that dries out. While my experience has been with mostly determinate cultivars or with some of those much smaller tomatoes and peppers, I know a number of individuals that have experimented with growing heirloom tomato plants in five gallon bucket systems and had very good success with it. I believe part of the Epic Tomatoes book goes into actually growing these large heirloom tomato plants in the five gallon bucket system um, and in container plants as well. The photos you see here is lunchbox pepper. So that's the lunchbox pepper variety here in the center of it, and then the one right beside it is a patio. I believe uh, the, I was also growing uh, fairy tale eggplant this season too. I just don't have a photo within this photo here. But very good success with these. Yields are gonna be much smaller. The plants stay pretty compact as well, which I think is pretty, pretty helpful in the situation. Yet again, my experience with containers is more five gallon bucket. Although I know a number of folks that will play around and having different containers too. Other ways to grow can include that straw bell system. There's a number of folks that are master gardener volunteers as well as others that really enjoy growing tomatoes and peppers in a straw bell system in which you are bringing in that straw bell and you're growing right into it. It does take a little bit of what they call conditioning, where you are applying lots of water for a number of consecutive days. You're following up with a fertilizer in order to begin that decomposition period and to help that straw media decompose much further. And then from there, you're trying to make sure that the temperature is, is really right and getting where it needs to be when it comes to it. Ideally, this may be two to three tomatoes per bale. This could be four peppers from the system too. And I'll send you an email today with another kind of brief overview of what this might look like. But a lot of folks really like this method. Another benefit to it is that it is raised much higher up. And so if you are wanting to kind of get your plants much higher up, closer to your eye level, 
this could be a good situation here too. Companion plants would also be something to consider at this point. Uh, this could be marigold, it could be basil. Both of them have been recommended before and we commonly see them used often in order to address insect pressure or repel insects from those tomatoes or peppers that we might be growing. There is a wonderful resource from Iowa State uh, on companion planting, and it goes into more of the science behind companion planting and gives you a great understanding of what companion planting can look like and what it can take to actually put this plan in order. Um, and I will also send that link to you as well so you have that document. It will go into additional vegetables as well, not just our tomatoes and peppers. So we, we're going to plant towards the end of May. We're thinking about our spacing. Um, keep in mind some other things, you know, soil pH needs between 6 and 7.5. If you've heard enough of me when it comes to soil, you know I always encourage adding organic matter, a compost, an aged manure. This could be applied right now um, if, you know, if your snow has melted, of course. But in the next week or two, you could apply this and go ahead and get your kind of garden area ready for your tomatoes and peppers and eggplant to go out in May. You always want to think about your fertilizers. We're aiming for full sun, although you may have some cultivars that could tolerate a little bit of shade with it. Consider crop rotation, especially if you've had problems the last couple of years. You wanna make sure that you're not planting this family of tomatoes, eggplant, peppers, and potatoes in the same area where those members were the previous year. You wanna make sure your crop rotation to help address disease problems. You also wanna to look to avoid black walnut trees, whether that is the closeness of their root systems that might be penetrating into that growing area, but also any kind of leaves or any kind of debris that might be getting on top of these plants. This plant family is very sensitive to black walnuts. While there are a number of vegetable families out there that can tolerate it, this family especially uh, cannot tolerate it. And you may find the growth of your tomatoes is just not where it needs to be because of some proximity to some black walnut trees and the jugulin compound. One of the other crucial steps to, to mention here is also mulching. When you are planting your tomato plants and peppers, they're gonna benefit greatly by having some kind of mulch in place. And typically this is going to be something like organic where it might be leaves, it might be straw, it might be something that's just put in place to really help provide um, weed control, but also to keep these plants very healthy and to keep water from splashing up on them. It can help to address water infiltration and it can also help to address blossom end rot, which we'll talk about today as well. Um, there's two types, this is organic and inorganic. Organic meaning something that's gonna break down into the soil versus inorganic, which may be those typical kind of plastic systems where it's a black plastic or a clear plastic that's put in place uh, in your growing area. You see in this photo that they're using uh, a base is going to be newspaper and they're following up with a straw, a straw mulch on top of it. Leaves and straw can be fine. If you are using grass clippings, be very aware of if your lawn has been treated. You may find that there could be some trace issues of any sorts of treatments that were applied to the grass. And when you have all these grass clippings, you may find further that that causes a problem. So be aware of that. Um, I, I don't know my turf grass as well as I should when it comes to lawn treatments, and yet just be a little bit cautious if you have any sort of treatment on your lawn, and then decide to use the grass clippings. If you have planted in May, and now all of a sudden you look at the forecast and we have cool temperatures, just yet again, no, they tend to tolerate the 40s and 50s. They tend to be okay with that. You may not find there's much growth to them or they're just kind of you know, unhappy for a period of time. But if you do get into the 30s, that's where we can see some damage. And it could be delayed ripening or maybe that it takes a couple of weeks for that recovery to bounce back. You could look towards providing some protection during this time period. And this could be a row cover, a floating row cover, which is a very uh, sh uh, sheer kind of covering, almost like a, um, 
almost like a bed sheet and yet still allows for light and water penetration. A number of folks will put out milk jugs and they will cut milk jugs and kind of create a little bit of a modified kind of greenhouse protection for the plant. You may also see plastic plant protectors. These kind of act as kind of a barrier. You fill them up with water and they can provide some insulation and some protection from those winter or rather that late cooler temperatures than what we were after. If this is an ongoing issue, you may consider shifting planting time. This could be that maybe you delay it into June, into mid-June, or maybe you delay it even back a month if this keeps occurring and you keep running into some major issues uh, with this. Um, there's nothing to say that everything has to go out in mid-May, end of May, when it comes to planting tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant. And so it may be shifting things a bit. Let's get into trellising then. This is a very common practice that we do when it comes to tomatoes and peppers and eggplant. And the idea being that you're getting that, the fruit, the tomatoes and others off of the ground. And this can allow for good airflow. This can also allow for the fruit to really kind of thrive and develop much better. And can also ensure that, you know, maybe the fruit is much more in, in greater quality. So I do encourage trellising and providing it with stakes or can make cages or others. Typically you'll plant about a, the place that's out a week or two after planting. There's nothing to say that you can't put the trellising and the staking system out at planting, which is kind of up to you and, and your situation. I use tomato cages. I also do a lot of more with kind of wooden stakes in situations. I know there's a number of these kind of ladders out there, these heavier kind of metal plastic covering ladders that I can add levels to as, as the plant gets taller and taller. And I could also make your own. If you have some scrap materials, you can kind of put together kind of your own situation uh, when it comes to this. One of the main things that we run into when it comes to using cages or stakes or metal stakes season after season is that we could actually be bringing in disease. And so it's very crucial before you put these back into the garden to try to clean them if you can. And usually, especially for tomato cages, the best way to do this can be if you have the availability of Lysol wipes or Clorox wipes or something where you could just kind of clean them up. It's especially crucial for anything that's touched the soil from the previous year. I know this can be kind of problematic and that can be hard to do as I have to do this every year when it comes to trying to clean, clean my cages as well as my stakes before they go back into the soil. But this could be a problem that you run into. You know, if you've crop rotated, if you've done all these measurements to address disease problems, and yet you're still maybe getting a disease issue that is maybe soil borne or soil related, it could be that it's coming from the previous year's tomato cages or stakes. So just keep that in mind. As always, each has their own pros and cons, and yet again, it gets back to what you're growing. If you're growing determinate tomatoes, you may decide that the cage is the best option compared to long rows of staking. So with tomato cages then, there's good options for those raised beds. Typically, you're planting one to two single plants. So one plant with per cage, let me be clear there. But you may find that if you just have a couple of tomato plants, this makes the most sense for you. Certainly determinate and smaller plants would do fine in the cage. The issue can be that there's a lot of flimsy tomato cages on the market, right? We're, we're used to a tomato cage being pretty flimsy. Many of them have gotten more heavy duty and a bit more of a metal to them, which is great. So they're more compact, but you will sometimes find that it's a mismatch. You've chosen a tomato plant or a pepper plant that has started to really take over that tomato cage somewhat what you see here in this photo with these two tomato plants. So if you are thinking that you want to do a, a bigger investment in the garden this season, this might be where you consider a heavier kind of steel type of tomato cage if that's what you're after and what you're deciding to choose with it. I am in the camp where I do a lot more with tomato staking and, and trellising. And in this photo, you could just individually stake that tomato and provide support right up against that plant as it grows and grows. The benefit to this system using string or poly or using some of those other pieces that you might have to tie that tomato plant 
to the stake is that you can decide at what level you want to actually put that string at. And you can also troubleshoot with it. The downside is that it can be pretty laborious and it can take a, a good part of your day stringing up this tomato, especially if you have a very long row, which is what I tend to have when it comes to my, my tomato plants. Um, you get to decide that height as mentioned, and I have started shifting more towards a mix. I have wood stakes for some of my tomatoes in a row. I also have metal stakes, those green kind of tea, tea type of metal stakes that I will use to help support my tomato, tomatoes. Yet again, I'm mostly growing those big heirloom tomato plants, and I know that they can need more support and begin to take over the garden situation. So I'm going to do a little bit of uh, some drawing here for you. And you do have this, these drawings. So I, I played around with Microsoft Paint yesterday. So in this situation, yet again, you know, to kind of walk through you know, some of the situations, this is determinate or hybrid tomatoes. In most cases, I think you're gonna find that these tomatoes could be, you could have two of these tomatoes between two stakes. I think that would be a fine option when it comes to it. Yet again, you know your situation and you may find that you could maybe do three, um, but I think you would get away with at least two when it comes to that determinate hybrid tomato type. We know it's gonna be pretty compact and so forth uh, with it. When it comes to then, you know, maybe what that trellis system might look like, um, typically your first line is going to be right below where that first kind of leaf set is. So you can see on my screen, I believe, kind of where I have actually started my line. It's right underneath that first um, tomato, um, tomato leaf set there. And then you're just kind of following it down the row. You're looping back with an, again, on this center stake. You're following it down to the end, and then you're coming back behind that next set of tomatoes, looping it again, and then falling back, and then tying it at the end. And that would be kind of your first level of tomato trellis. From there, it's going to kind of depend on kind of what you're after. You know, you could come in maybe four to four to six inches higher up, and you could actually then, um, oops, sorry about that. You could actually then. Um, move this, so you could actually kind of come up four to six inches, put in that new line. You kind of see in this image that we're right underneath some of the fruit as it's developing, so providing really good support in this situation. And you will typically see that this, these lines in these string is pretty tight up against that plant. Yet again, I'm looping down at the end, making it pretty tight and secure. We loop back in the center to provide support, and then we tie it again at the end and you're just making your way up that tomato plant. And usually what I find is I'm having to do this kind of based on where the fruit is developing, because that's really where you need the most support in this situation. So this is determinate hybrid tomatoes. When we look at indeterminate heirloom tomato plants, this is one where I would encourage you to have spacing pretty pretty close to the stakes. What I find is that because these plants are going to be so tall and get so big, I almost need a stake on both sides to support the plants. I just don't find that I can actually do a good job when it comes to having, say, um, two tomatoes in the center. I think I just need them one stake on both sides. The other thing I've also started doing is having stakes on the ends to provide weight and to provide support. I recognize this drawing uh, could be better, and yet I find a good steel stake on the ends can really push the weight towards the end and not on the center. It's a very imperfect situation. I recognize that crucially uh, when it comes to, comes to this situation. And yet I find there's some really good support here in this situation by having some metal stakes on the end. Occasionally I will also put a metal stake in the middle of my tomato row to yet again try to provide some support for those tomatoes. I also will usually have a mix of both wood stakes and metal stakes in my row too. But I find that having some kind of much more metal support 
or in a staking situation can be very helpful um, and be very crucial when it comes to providing these tomatoes their support. The same could be said with peppers as well as eggplant. I would probably look at more of the terminant or the hybrid situation for those. I wanted to go back just briefly because one of the things I wanted to mention here is that you see in this determinate hybrid tomato situation, I did a cross here. So instead of actually going down the row and looping back, I'm actually crossing between my tomatoes. And this is a method that's a hybrid of the Florida weave, where you see you're getting this cross between the plants with that first line of, of support. The idea being that this could provide some additional support that you might need with your plants. I've done this with determinate tomatoes, I've done this with indeterminate tomatoes, um, and I found that this kind of, that first line having a cross can provide some additional support. You're not going to then be doing it for the next line. The next line will still go back to that kind of traditional uh, looping and support and trellis system. But it's really that first line where doing a single cross can maybe help support the, the plants. So that's a brief overview of staking and trellising support. I, I appreciate you letting me kind of do a hybrid type of, of study within there. We can talk a little bit more at the end today of, of that system, but recognize that everyone has a different way of doing and supporting their, their plants. Um, I like stakes. I like doing a string kind of trellising system. One of the other things to mention here is when you're planting and you've gotten the, the plants have been supported, is you may look to do some pruning. And this is done with the indeterminate open pollinated heirloom varieties where you will be removing a little bit of a growth right after the first flower cluster. And so this first flower cluster will usually be high, higher above the plant. You can see where my, um, my cursor is. And the sucker removal will be right here. So almost in the armpit of where the stem of the plant, the leaf stem is meeting the main stem and main trunk uh, is what you're removing. And this can really be useful because it can help you when it comes to better growth of the plant because at that point you're not needing that much growth much lower than the first flower cluster. But this would just be something that's kind of helpful here that you could do. And you may find it to be very big on your plant as well. Uh, what I do find folks will do is they will actually remove this and take it and they may actually start it in their garden somewhere else. It will provide some good growth um, for you too. In most cases, that determinant or hybrid tomato does not need to be pruned. Uh, you may look at topping indeterminant tomatoes further. There's some guidance out there, and yet we don't see as much uh, information when it comes to if that practice makes much of a difference. So when it comes to the main pruning that you might be doing, it would be the sucker removal of an indeterminate, open pollinated heirloom type of tomato. Right below that first flower cluster it would be great. Other individuals will also strip the lower leaves below that first flower cluster, and that might be a fine method to do. Um, but otherwise, when we talk about pruning, we're really talking about just that sucker removal. So we'll get into insects and diseases now, and then we'll finally kind of finish up with our physical disorders and some of those environmental issues. For a lot of times with our, our big insects, which you see here, uh, tobacco and tomato hornworm, you know, those are very commonly seen and we see them a lot in, in the garden. We'll see lots of white flies and aphids and others within the garden and on tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant. And you also see white flies and aphids too. They tend to be pretty, pretty dominant when it comes to them. As far as how you might address the insects, you know, there can be solutions such as hand picking. Um, it could be that you actually just tolerate the plant. You may also find that a couple of your leaves are heavily infested with very small insects, and you may decide to actually remove that leaf, and that maybe could help control the insects. You will find sometimes chemical uh, insecticides are available too, and yet again, some of them may have to be directly applied onto those insects in order to address it, to address control. 
You may also look towards uh, netting or row cover, especially if your plants have already flowered and have already started to develop lots of fruit. You may find that a row cover could help when it comes to insect control for something like tomatoes and peppers and eggplant. Yet again, you would want to make sure that your, that your fruit had already been pollinated and you already have it ready to go. Very common ones, you see aphids at the side and occasionally aphids will have sooty mold on them developed. So it's kind of a, kind of a blackish kind of uh, tar appearance to it and feeling to it. You'll see white flies on the right. This is also very common for my tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, and lots of others. If the infestation was pretty severe, you may find that the easiest solution is just to remove a couple of the leaves. That can sometimes be the, the best step here. Yet again, maybe you'll find minimal damage when it comes to your tomatoes and peppers uh, in regards to maybe these smaller insects. For your bigger ones, tomato, tobacco, hornworm, I use this term back and forth because both of them tend to be heavily destructors in the garden and on the tomatoes and peppers. They are very pronounced. They tend to be also as big as your index finger and sometimes hand removal can be crucial for them. In this photo, you actually see a parasitoid wasp eggs that have been laid into the hornworm. And so as the hornworm is slowly dying, these parasitoid wasp eggs will be released and could be an insect predator in the rest of your vegetable garden. So at this stage, I don't know if I would actually kill this insect. I might just allow for the hornworm to thrive and, and do its thing because all these parasitoid predator eggs will be hatching soon. The other photo you see is tomato fruit worm. Commonly, you will go out to your garden about a month or two after planting and you see this beautiful red tomato and you think to yourself, oh, the first tomato of the season, I'm so happy to have it. And then when you actually turn it over, you will see that the tomato fruit worm has damaged it. Because of its uh, action of being in the fruit itself, it can be very hard to control this insect. And so there can be some sprays and some insecticides available, but you may find it's just easier to do some hand picking and to remove the fruit that has been severely damaged by this and killing these insects. I mentioned some diseases here. You know, it's very dependent on our season. You know, depending on how, it's whether it's going to be a very hot season, a cold season, if we have lots of rain and wetness, if the leaves stay wet, if it's dry, that's all gonna play a factor along with where that disease and pathogen might be. Many of them can move through water, air, as well as soil, and sometimes insects will also move them. We always recommend watering in the morning and avoiding contact with wet plants. The reason for this is that if you water in the evening and your plants are covered and stay wet, it's possible that, that a pathogen could move in via air um, and infect the, the tomato plants or the peppers. And with this wet, cooler temperatures in the evening, it's more liable to be a problem. So I always encourage folks to actually water in the morning to help with this. When it comes to disease control, certainly crop rotate. That's gonna be crucial here. Look towards a mulching system to help in place. I advocate for disease resistance and think about airflow. If you've had numerous years of issues with disease and you've done all of these strategies, it might be that you need to have better airflow with your plants and to allow for a better airflow so those leaves can really dry out, which means you may be spacing them a little bit further than usual. And as always, you know, try to get these diseases diagnosed properly. That's what we really are after for, is you want to have that proper diagnosis. Um, so I mentioned just a couple of these. This is one of the most common ones, early blight. It is more fungal, it's more airborne. You see small brown circulars on the leaves, and these could also spread to the stems. Always look to plant resistant varieties. Look to also rotate out of the family. You also want to remove debris from the garden after the season and destroy this debris. This may mean that you're actually bagging it up in trash bags and throw it away. This would not be one to put in the compost bin uh, in that situation. And then also look towards air circulation as well. But yelling of leaves, very common appearance. 
This is late blight. You see it a little bit more sometimes on the actual um, fruit of the tomatoes itself, much more severe. You also will know it looks very different than what that early blight looks like too. Yet again, a fungal airborne. So it can be a little bit hard to control because we maybe don't have enough protection around the tomatoes and peppers that we might be growing. So you will find black brown leaves. You'll see it kind of all over the plants themselves. Yet again, look towards crop rotation look to remove infected tubers after the season. And you may also want to look towards cultivars that have some form of disease resistance. Phytophthora blight, this is more of that focused in the soil. I see it a lot more with pepper plants. It's a very noticeable disease compared to some of the other plants that you might be dealing with, or rather some of the other diseases that you might have encountered or dealt with previously. You may find that in a row of say 10 to 15 peppers, that it may just be one of them that's gotten hit the worst compared to the others. And so you would want to remove that pepper before it could move to the rest. Yet again, you still wanna think about that crop rotation, um, but you may see some, some pretty severe damage with it. Bacterial spot speck, very common on most uh, tomatoes and peppers we see a lot of. It tends to be spread by splashing rain and moist conditions. It's also something where we see lots of spots on leaves. It's spreading to the fruit, causing fruit rot. This is one where you want to consider potentially cleaning seeds or purchasing new seeds every year. Perhaps you save some seeds and you've gotten a bad infection of this. And so it is that it just keeps um, showing back up. Although we do see it every, every year, usually it may not just be um, too severe to worry too much about. Um, yet again, just kind of be mindful, mindful of it. And I'm using the term solanaceous now. Recognize the solanaceous family is the nightshade family. So this is eggplant, peppers, uh, tomatoes, and potatoes. Sorry about that. I just realized I started using that term here. Cucurbits is cucumbers, melons, squash, and others. Septoria leaf spot, lots of leaf spots, defoliation. It's a very different appearance than the blights, and you see in the photo what this, this looks like. Some folks have had success with removing pretty severe parts of the plant and still being able to get the rest of their tomatoes that season. Yet again, you know, it's just going to be very crucial um, to dispose of crop residue, crop rotate, and control weeds in this situation. It does tend to overwinter on host plant debris, and this may be where you weren't necessarily crop rotating enough, and or there was just some leaf tissue you used from the previous year in your compost, and it did not um, compost enough and address killing that, that pathogen. Our last one, Fusarium verticillin wilt. Both of these look very similar and yet they both are based on the weather patterns. So it is very warm weather in the 70s, 80s, and 90s where we tend to see this become much more of a problem if that pathogen is there versus verticillium where it could be periods of 40s, 50s, and 60s where this disease of verticillium may really thrive. Lots of wilting symptoms, kind of yellowing, browning of leaves. It's very important during this period to maintain moisture with your plants, making sure that they're getting enough water that they need. Try to not over fertilize where then now new growth can occur and potentially spread more of that disease. And then always try to crop rotate if necessary. So this next section is physical deformities. These are things that we see pretty often in tomatoes and peppers, but they're not a disease. It is just something that maybe is based on the genetics of that tomato. It could be based on weather, could be based on rainfall, it could be based on a number of features. It could delay ripening if these show up. It could also delay maturity. There is potential for this to spread diseases easier because there's now openings for pathogens. In most cases, they're going to be edible. You shouldn't have any issues with them, but it could be it's just a really ugly tomato. And this is especially true with indeterminates. The photo you see here is cat facing. This is a very common uh, appearance on indeterminate, heirloom, open pollinated tomatoes. You should expect when you grow those to have really ugly fruit. 
it's just the genetics of that plant that due to how it's growing, um, responds and grows very, very weird looking. Some of the other ones that we see is sun scald. And so you see sun scald here on the right. And this was a photo I took from one of our pepper plants the previous summer. What's happening here is that the pepper fruit, the actual fruiting body, is growing faster than the leaves. And so this is not allowing for proper, um, proper uh, protection from the sun. And you'll see this kind of brownish, blackish mold start to develop on the plant or on the pepper here of the sun scald. It is uh, gross. Uh, you need to remove it. It's a very soft kind of rot to the plant. And typically it will work itself out. You don't need to worry too much that you have a disease problem because you don't. It's just the plant is not growing fast enough for the pepper and the tomatoes uh, to allow for protection. Cracking is another common occurrence, and this is a um, and um, this is a disorder in which the actual internal part of the tomato is growing faster than the actual outside part of the skin. So it's a mismatch, and because of this, you get this cracking appearance. Usually, this cracking will actually uh, seal itself up, which you actually see has happened in this cracking photo. Most of those indeterminate open pollinated and heirloom plants are a little bit more predisposed to the cracking situation compared to others. Splitting is more environmentally based. Usually you have had, had a very long period, maybe a couple of days without any type of water or rainwater, and then you have an abundance of water all at once. And so you have this splitting occurring. So that's more environmentally based um, with more rainfall and frequency on the splitting. Cracking should be something that works itself out. The plant should kind of balance itself when it comes to developing the fruit. And splitting is something where mulching could be used to hopefully address that splitting if it was to occur, having a slower in frequency of water being taken up by the plant. Blossom end rot is one of the most common physical disorders in tomatoes. Occasionally, we will also see it with peppers and eggplant. The main culprit is that water is not moving frequently enough to bring the calcium from the soil to the ends of those tomatoes, plant tomatoes that are developing. In most cases, calcium application is not recommended. Um, what you find is that you know maybe one or two of your new plants is having some issues and you will then remove this fruit and the rest of the plant should be okay. However, you know, you may find that all the fruit that's developing is developing blossom end rot and it could be a calcium related issue. In most cases, our recommendation is to just mulch to allow for a better uptake of water and allow for a better uptake of that calcium since calcium is moving with the water through the plant as it's being taken up and hopefully it will work itself out, out too. Now let's get kind of to, in today, um, some of these more environmental issues I've run into. So we see things like cold nights, and this is more or less when we're getting into the 55 degree Fahrenheit temperatures in the evening. Um, tomatoes and peppers, they may drop fruit, the fruit may not develop. We've seen this very frequently in August, the last couple of years in Northern Illinois, as I share with you, every backyard is different. I recognize that. And yet this has been a very common occurrence where the beautiful fruit is on the plant uh, August 1st and it's sitting there. <laughs> it's not doing anything. You're waiting for some kind of hint that your tomatoes should be harvested and picked and nothing's happening. Um, this is something that's a little bit out of your control. You know, typically it will work itself out. But if this is a yearly current, you may start earlier with row cover or protection. There's also a number of cultivars that have a short maturity date, and they also have a colder climate tolerance. And these may be ones to consider, such as Celebrity, New Yorker, and Legend. Most of those are a very traditional red canning and preserving tomato. Another issue is hot water, ugh, hot weather. It's when it's just too hot, 90s in the days, 75 at night, especially 75 at night 
kind of that mixture of both. You know, you find the flowers just there and nothing is happening. And what's occurring is that the pollen is unavailable. The pollinators cannot access this pollen at this time, and they're not setting the fruit, but you have so much uh, abundance of these flowers. Yet again, you know, there are some heat tolerant varieties and cultivars, and still encourage you to keep those very plants healthy as much as you can, and hopefully the weather will improve. We've seen this sometimes in July in parts of Joe Davis County, where it's just gotten too hot for a period of time. And this may be a week or two, and then we get back to some normalcy, if you will, when it comes to it. What about too much water? I know, especially the last couple of years, June has been severely wet in Northern Illinois. We've had way more water than we really need. Every week during the growing season, we need about one and a half to two inches of rainwater for the plant to uptake. And yet we've had some years of June where we've had 16, 20 inches of rain fall uh, in a single month. So just a lot of abundance of rain, much more than we really are, are after and need. It could be, you know, if you tried a new cultivar last year or a new variety, you might try it out again this year, especially if you felt like the rainwater and the abundance of water was the main issue with its poor performance. I grew Mountain Merit for the first time this last year. It is a little bit more of an early season tomato, and I found that it actually produced much later than usual. And I, I do chalk this up to some early season water issues and some other things. And I'm still gonna to try to grow Mountain Merit again this year to see how it does, um, just because I don't think it was a cultivar related issue. Look to also add mulch to slow infiltration around the plants. Um, add compost before the season two can sometimes help get that fluffy cookie crumb kind of uh, soil texture that you're after. But recognize you may need to come back with compost and fertility, especially after periods of substantial rain. I know that's what a number of folks ran into is that they planted the end of May, they had you know, 16, 17 inches of rain in the month of June, and they did need to come back and add some compost and fertility to hopefully address the tomato, pepper, and other vegetables in their garden. So you've survived. You've made it through growing tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant. You've planted them correctly. You've trellised them. You have addressed insects, diseases, and other issues. You have hopefully had a very uh, normal growing season, which I know normal is not the right term, my goodness. And now we're at harvest. So the tomatoes are ready, the peppers are ready. Know that cherry, pear, and lots of those other types of, of shaped and colored tomatoes tend to do well with full color. So picking sun gold tomato, which is a nice cherry tomato, I usually need to harvest it at, at full color, that full orange color. Some of those other tomatoes, whether they're an indeterminate or a determinate, could actually be harvested for at first blush. In the photo, you see pink Berkeley tie-dye. And pink Berkeley tie-dye will be more colorful when it comes to its orange or rather to its pink coloration. But I harvest my tomatoes at pink blush. And you can just barely see in this photo, you know, this hint of a pink blush appearance. So it is not yet um, that full color that I'm expecting. And the reason that I harvest at pink blush, or rather this first blush appearance, is that the tomato is not gonna get any bigger. Once it gets to that color, or that first blush appearance, it's ready to go. It's not necessarily ready to eat, but I can take it off of my plants. I can lay it out for a couple of days in kind of a dry area of my house that isn't too hot. And then I can allow for the color to develop further. The reason I do this is that sometimes I'm growing such heavy tomatoes that I want to get them off of the vines so I can support the rest of my plant and support the rest of those tomatoes that are still very young and still growing. And I do this, this is one method I've done for years, is to actually just kind of take them off uh, once they've got this first blush. The flavor is not gonna be any different if I left them on the vine. The color would not be any different if I left them fully ripen on the vine. It's just going to allow for my plants to kind of get off the vine, off the plants, 
and develop their color further off of it. It may also allow and keep um, splitting from occurring, cracking from occurring, some of those physical disorders that if I left them on the plants may worsen and get worse. So this is the method that I do. But you've got to make sure you're at pink blush uh, with this. And you'll, it's noticeable very much on a lot of our red and orange tomatoes. You may not see it as clearly with some of those other ones. And yet again, I, I tend to see this more with the slicer tomatoes than I do with the paste and the cherry, the pear shapes and others. As you're doing this, remove any tomato stems too. These tend to actually cut into your tomatoes. So go ahead and have a habit of kind of pushing them off of the, uh, off of the top of the tomato, that little stem there. Because if you're gathering them in a big bucket or an area, you will find that they will cut into each other uh, too. Also try to not have them in the fridge. Tomatoes will lose much of their flavor when they're actually paid placed into a fridge, the flavor tends to kind of mess around with, um, or rather the temperatures tend to mess around with the flavor of your tomatoes. So avoid placing them in the fridge if you can. Peppers are going to depend on the characteristics, the color, the shape you're after here. In most cases, eggplant tends to be used in a little bit more shiny and also not dull in its coloration. So we're getting wrapped up today. I can see in the chat box, there's a number of questions, so, which is great. I'm gonna to try to get to a lot of them today if I can. One thing to just mention, there's a lot of blog posts happening right now um, when it comes to the University of Illinois Extension. This includes good growing, flowers, fruits, and frass. I, myself, and Bruce Black are writing a lot of entries into the Raise, Grow, Harvest, Eat, Repeat blog, which you'll find a link in at my email whenever I send you emails, you'll see that link at the bottom. We also still continue to have a number of webinars. This includes Growing Horticulture in Northwest Illinois. This is held on Wednesdays by Bruce Black, as well as myself in a couple of weeks. And this is April 1st to May 13th, 1030 to 1130 a.m. The Beginning Gardener series will wrap up next week. And this is in the evening from six to seven. And then the Four Seasons Garden Webinar Series is on Tuesdays at 1.30. And this is April 21st through May 26th. They have extended this garden series and they're now covering a number of topics related to vegetable gardening as fruit production as well. Um, so if you saw what it looked like a couple weeks ago, know that it's actually changed up, that there's some newer topics that they're adding for the year. So as we get wrapped up, you know, I always encourage you to really know its features, you know, and, and think about what you're planting and how it fits into your cooking as well as what cooks and fits into your vegetable growing situation for that season. I think it's very crucial to kind of know those features and what you're getting yourself, then, getting yourself into perhaps. Look to space correctly. I think that's going to ensure at least a good start to your growing season and then plan more and more for insects and diseases. I know I've rushed through those insects and disease section and yet I still want you to have those photos and see what some of the recommendations are when it comes to controlling them, both the insects and the disease side. One of the main steps that I think is gonna put you on the right path towards having good yields this summer is going to be mulching around your tomato plants and your pepper plants, making sure that they have really what they need. And gosh, have a good season, right? That's what I'm really after. And what I hope you have is a very good tomato, bell pepper, eggplant, and many other vegetable uh, growing season this year too. As of right now, my 2020 tomatoes is going to be Valencia, Sun Gold, Cherokee Purple, and then new one this year is San Marzona. I know a number of people that grow San Marzona and love it, um, so that will be added in there as well. I will also be planting some resistant varieties because as you look at my list, most of them have some kind of disease susceptibility. So I will be adding those in, but as I share with you, I'm an orange tomato guy uh, and really like slicer tomatoes. The photo you see here is taken from a couple years back. You can actually see the Valencia tomato here, uh, that very dark, dark orange coloration. And you also notice a mixture of mostly a lot of Cherokee purple tomatoes is in that photo. 
So uh, I'll go through the chat box with some questions. That is my email address, and that's also my phone number. I am answering phone calls right now, so if you feel free to jot that down, I'd be more than happy to kind of answer some of your questions you have. You will get an email from me today with some additional resources and a link to the evaluation survey, which I always appreciate folks filling out, especially as it guides our programming. We are looking to develop another webinar series after taking a couple weeks break. So we look towards that towards the mid-May for that to happen. Um, so any suggestions you have for the next wave of webinar series can is greatly appreciated and you will find that option in, our, uh, in the Qualtrics survey, which you could take an image of if, of your phone right there. I do have a Facebook and we are trying to be more active when it comes to this uh, getting out content and information. So let's get to some questions. I'm gonna open the chat box and look through it. All right. All right, one of the first questions was, our landscape guide mentioned that we are no longer zone five now, but we're zone five. Do you know anything in regards to that? This is in the Galena area. Um, we've not had an official change just yet based on the USDA planting zone. I would still, you know, consider that you're in zone 5A, zone 5B, but certainly it may change in a couple of years. Um, but as of right now, I would, I would think you'd be fine. You may find that the difference between zone 4 and zone 5 may just be a week or two difference. I think you're still very comfortable planting this family towards the end of, of May, um, but yet again, you may have to adjust. Are all determinate, so question, are all determinate tomato hybrids, are there open pollinated determinate tomatoes? Um, usually, this is where those words all kind of get thrown around quite a bit, Andy. Um, there may be some kind of, you know, open pollinated variety that has kind of that determinate feature, if you will, when it comes to being a bit more stature and having some compactness to it. But in most cases, when we talk about that kind of determinate hybrid, we tend to kind of use those terms the same. Uh, we don't tend to see that open pollinated determinate tomato. It could be it's just an open pollinated tomato that has that smaller bush type stature to it. All right, how do you prevent blossom in rotten peppers and tomatoes? All right, we've, we've talked a little bit about that. Look towards the mulch situation to hopefully address that. That can help get it out early on. Um, and just kind of watch your water infiltration with that too. Next question, what is a typical yield for uh, per eggplant? This is one that can be all over the place. I found when I was growing Hansel and those Gretel fairy tale type of eggplants, I was probably getting between three to four pounds of eggplant um, per plant, but I also have grown traditional globe eggplant previously, and I might be getting between 20 and 25 uh, per plant. You kind of see they're in little clusters of occasionally of three to four, but you may not get enough out of them just depending on the situation. So I would say your yield is probably gonna be 20 to 25 in a given season. Uh, for tomatoes, or rather for your eggplant. Uh, we've talked about hornworms. That was a question someone brought up. Let's see. How much soil do you need a container to plant peppers? I think you're at six inch minimum for pepper plants, but I think it's gonna be very crucial to consider what that pepper plant might be. If it is a bell plant, especially a very vigorous bell plant, you may find that you need to get up to eight to 10 inches, if not more. I know as I have grown these bell plant peppers, they need a lot more support sometimes than those smaller statured pepper plants do. And you may find that you need to go up to that eight to 10 inches and really provide more support. And certainly I think look towards a, a staking situation. For smaller plants, for small barrel pepper plants, I'd look maybe towards six. For those bigger ones, I'd push more towards eight to 10 inches of soil in a container. 
Okay. Yeah. Could you comment on growing tomatoes and peppers in Strawbell Garden? A lot of people have had very good success with it. I know a number of Master Gardener volunteers that have done it. Some of the benefits is that you're able to provide greater support to the, uh, to the tomatoes and peppers in that system. Of course, you may not be able to really have a lot of, uh, of these just based on the spacing of the, the straw bell. I would also think you may be very limited in how many and kind of what types of tomato plants you could put in there. I think you certainly could put in that open pollinated heirloom type, but you're probably not gonna be able to put more than two, and even two plants might be pushing it. There is some great benefits to it though, and I think that people who have done straw bell gardening will sometimes say, I don't wanna go back to ever doing anything <laughs> in the soil. Does Extension have any plans, instruction for uh, do-it-yourself self-watering containers for growing tomatoes? This is something I need to look into a little bit more, Sherry. Um, I don't know of anything right now, but let me, um, I will kind of look through that. And if you want to send me an email, I can see what I can find out for you. When comparing tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant, of those three, which type of plant has the most shade tolerance? In most cases, I think you're gonna be fine with eggplants having some pretty good tolerance to shade, um, at least just a little bit. These, this group still needs a lot of sunlight. I would also think that smaller plants, such as those in containers, um, the patio, the lunchbox, those could probably do when it comes to shade tolerance. I'd be a little bit hesitant to look towards those open pollinated and heirloom tomatoes as I think they're going to need a lot more sunlight and may not be as tolerant of shade. Like you, Andy, I also have some shade issues in my backyard and this is the first year where I am kind of experimenting with shade and seeing some of the tolerations that these plants will have. Um, I would think at this state though, it's eggplant and some smaller ones. So Stacy asked that she's got black walnut leaves that are going to a compost pile and eventually make it to the garden. Could this be causing issues with these plants a year later? In most cases, Stacy, I don't believe it will. What we do find is that it is more the root systems of the black walnut that tend to be a bigger issue. And while the leaves, when they are kind of scattered out, they will actually start to decompose that joglin compound. I've got a resource that I will send out today to everyone, which will go into a little bit more detail on this, but I don't know if that might be the cause of it. I don't think you're gonna have, have much of that. I think it's gonna allow for it to kind of break down in kind of a composting system. All right, question is, uh, any suggestion on chipmunks, ground squirrels, and others out of the garden? Would it be feasible to line the entire garden with something um, underneath the soil? My garden is well fenced, but of course they're very underneath. This is a hard question uh, about wildlife control. You're certainly on the right path when it comes to actually providing some kind of restriction to keep them from getting into it. You might also look towards some of those kind of bittering agents uh, that might be applied you know, around the border, or the perimeter of, of the plants itself. And this may be also too where you look towards something to kind of line the entire garden to keep them from burying underneath. Unfortunately, it's very hard sometimes to make good recommendations because wildlife, and especially some of these smaller mammals, can be very vigorous when it comes to adapting. I have seen some individuals actually kind of create much higher up their garden, in which case that might be something that you might be able to do. Um, but it, it's really hard, hard to do. And I, at this point, I don't have as good of a suggestion as I can for that. I would look to try to raise the garden up if you could. You may try to put some barriers in place, and then it may be that you actually have some kind of bittering agents or something around the perimeter that maybe would deter them. If you also found a vegetable that they loved, it might be that you actually grow that one much further away from your others and use it as a sacrifice. Hopefully that that might deter them to go that direction. A question, the past few years, I've had plants set a few tomatoes and then the leaves yellow and fall off starting at the bottom of the plant until the plant simply dies out after one harvest. I'm guessing early blight. Is there anything I can do to prevent this? 
Uh, so crop rotation certainly ha is the best recommendation to, to use in this situation. Um, you might also, if this is something where it might be coming more airborne, you might try to create some kind of barrier between your plants and the rest of the plants. So it could be providing some kind of windbreak and protection. This may also be something where you, you maybe decide to um, look to have maybe a floating row cover in place once the plants have actually um, you know, uh, started to develop their fruit. Another strategy could also be to kind of open and space your plants much further to allow for better airflow. Maybe that could help, really help when it comes to getting better airflow in there to keep it from being a problem. So that might be the best strategy, especially since you've done crop rotation already. Uh, someone suggested keep watering of the lower leaves helped with the yellowing problems. That might be a, a question. Andy asked, do you need to prune sucker below each flower cluster? Not necessarily. I think what you're gonna find when you look at that plant after say one or two weeks of planting, you're just gonna see it like one time usually. Um, so you'll see just maybe two different suckers on each side underneath that flower cluster that need to be removed. You're not gonna find it significantly about the rest of the plant. And I should clarify here, Andy, that I'm saying the first flower cluster. I wouldn't do it higher up in the, in the, in the tomato plant because you are at risk to actually be removing some of your tomatoes. So it's always below that first flower cluster. I should clarify here. Pruning, did you say to remove the sucker and the branch it's on? So no, you'll just remove where that little sucker is and keep that branch in place. What's really happening there is that it's just an additional extra growth than what you really need. So you're just gonna remove that tiny little growth between the stem and the main stalk, but you're gonna leave that branch on. It's just gonna help out a bit. Question, do you also see white flies and aphids together on leaves? Occasionally you can see that. You can see that quite often is that they will both be um, on there together. They tend to kind of bridge the gap and work together sometimes. And you may find the advantage there then is that it is a, um, it is an issue where um, you could take that whole leaf off or you could just spray that target area to address both of those. Can you prevent form worms and fr fruit worms? You can sometimes prevent them and a lot of it's gonna get back to insect scouting. So if you turn under the leaves of a lot of your tomato plants, you will start to see the eggs of the hornworm and the fruitworm. There's guides out there that will show you what that looks like. And that will be what you actually want to remove and how you could really start to prevent it. This may also be where you have some kind of barrier in place if your fruits have developed, but I share with you a lot of it's hand picking in a lot of cases. Does Phytophthora blight occur rapidly? Um, it can occur rapidly. I don't see it too often in our planting zone, but it can be something that can happen pretty fast and move pretty fast. Although typically removing one plant in that single row should help out quite a bit. Uh, sun scald on peppers, it can resemble blossom end rot, but there is a bit of a disconnect. So it is gonna be more of a blackish, brownish, kind of soft fungal thing to it compared to blossom end rot that tends to kind of harden up a little bit. Third question, is blossom end rot most common early in the season? Most of the time it is more common in the early season. Yet again, it depends on what our season looks like and kind of what we're growing with it. Question, I've experienced a lot of cracking on my tomatoes in the past. I was not sure what it is with at the time. Are these tomatoes still good to eat? Yes, they're, they're fine to eat. You know, you don't have any disease issues at all with these cracking. You can cut around it. Um, you shouldn't have any issues when it comes to actually eating them and, and, and preparing them. Question, how about putting eggshells at base of tomato plants to encourage calcium uptake? Uh, this is a good question and I stumbled upon a post from one of our extension educators recently and I will send that resource out to you because there is some thought that you could put some broken up eggshells around the base of the plants to help encourage the calcium uptake. Um, it's, it's an opportunity you could do, uh, but you have to get it finely ground is what I understand. And yet again, I'll send out kind of that resource uh, today as well. Question, how close can mulch be to plants? I try to keep it pretty close. Um, 
I, I allow for a little bit of airflow around the stem, but I still kind of keep it pretty, pretty tight around there just to ensure that the water is not splashing up on the plant. So it can be up to you how close you want it, but I will typically try to be right near that base, not only to address weed control, but to also help with water splash that may splash up on the plant itself too. Question, when buying tomato transplants, are there any advantages to buying a larger 12 inch pot, for instance, versus the smaller one? We, a smaller one. There may be a little bit, but I think once the growing season starts and once it's actually in your growing area, you're not necessarily going to see much, uh, much advantage over it. I think as long as you're getting a very healthy, good looking tomato plant, you will be on the right path when it comes to a good season. So I, I don't see too much difference as long as it's a good, solid looking plant that doesn't have any major disease issues or, or anything on it. Question, we've always removed most suckers on our tomato plants, but it sounds like you recommend removing only the first bottom suckers. That's what I'm encouraging. When you look at some of the science and the data, you don't see as much out there when it comes to maybe changes in yields. The only advantage that you might have with removing suckers higher up in the tree, or rather the plant, is that it could help more with airflow. That would be the only thing that you might help with. And if you were removing higher up in that plant, you could be taking out some additional tomatoes, and that may be fine, especially if your tomatoes are yielding so great for you. Question, do you recommend rototilling the soil each year? Typically I do, you know, if you, can, if you can do that, I still encourage you to come back with some kind of compost or aged manure, but every situation is different. You may find in a raised bed situation that you don't need to do any soil disturbance. I think it gets back to what your growing situation is. The less soil disturbance is what you're after, and it may just be that one soil disturbance this year is with the rototilling. Question, could you rotate peppers, tomatoes, cucumbers, and eggplant I'm sorry, rotate peppers, tomatoes, cucumbers, and zucchini in your garden each year. I think cucumber is going to be the, cucumber zucchini is going to be the main issue because that rotation, you may find some carryover between some cultivars and varieties. You could probably still do it if that's where your spacing situation is, but just recognize that there may be some issues there uh, with it. And so you may actually decide to kind of limit those rotations uh, of cucumber and zucchini in mixing with peppers and tomatoes. I might stick more towards a broccoli or kale or something else within that rotation. Question, how far away from black walnuts should these plants be? Can black walnut trees affect raised beds? Our raised beds are about 40 feet away. Kathy, I need to find that resource uh, that I looked at a couple of days ago. I'll send that out to you. At this point, I, I don't have a good estimate for what, for what that is. Question, I thought you needed to remove the sucker growth between the stem and now you need to root branches all the way up the tomato. Are you saying to do it for the first branch from the soil only? Uh, yes, that's what I'm, I'm sharing. Uh, folks can go further up, but just know that we usually don't see much of an advantage with it when it comes to yield. It could just very much be that you have better airflow and can help with some of that disease control issues. Someone said that you, question, someone said you could bury several inches of the tomato stem, removing leaves first along with the root system. Yes or no? I've seen a lot of folks do this, uh, when user. Um, this is one where if you do that, it could provide much greater support for that actual tomato plant and give a much better stem support to it. It is up to you whether you want to do that. I've done it before and had pretty good um, pretty good success with it in my growing situation. Um, it's kind of, I think every grow is a little bit different, uh, but you may find that that could help out, help you out quite a bit, providing much more support uh, for that plant as it grows in the soil. Oh, hi Art. Uh, Art shares he's mixed a cup of common barn lime found at most big box stores into the soil planting sites for tomatoes to increase housing uptake. Good point, Art. That might be a little bit easier, especially to use compared to say, um, you know, some of the eggshells. Uh, I wanna get back to one question we started off with today. Molly, I hope you're still on the call. So Molly's question was, 
She's had trouble the past few years with tomato plants that die from the bottom up. She's significantly reducing the number of tomatoes they're getting from that plant. They've tried moving the plants to different parts of the garden to no availability. What are some thoughts that you might have here? You know, moving means planting them initially in different parts of the garden, not transplanting during the season. You know, I think that this is something where, you know, certainly you're doing your crop rotation, which is good. You may look to try out a different cultivar variety to kind of see if that maybe might help some of this with it dying back. I think you also want to make sure if you're doing any tomato cages or staking that those are staying clean. And another thing is it might be spacing. You know, you might need to actually space them a little bit wider to help better with airflow. To me, if you saw those photos and it didn't feel like it was a disease, it could be some environmental issue going on here. And that might be where by spacing them a little bit further, having better airflow, and maybe addressing them, uh, pruning some even more might help some with it. Uh, so those might be my main things to look at is crop rotation, new cultivar or variety, make sure tomato cages and so forth are clean, um, maybe remove prune the plants if needed and maybe prune higher up in the plants to maybe help with that. Uh, make sure that you're gonna mulch around the, the plant. Um, and there still could be something else out there. If you do have photos from last year, please feel free to send those to me and we can talk a little bit more after today as well. All right, we're over time, but I'm gonna answer one more question. Uh, Andy, can you bury several inches of stem when planting leggy tomatillos? Yes, you should be pretty good with this advantage, uh, Andy, is to go a little bit further and provide much more support for that plant. I think a lot of them, tomatoes, eggplant, tomatillos, um, and peppers would benefit by being a little bit under, you know, much lower depth and kind of having them lay across and then they will kind of grow kind of upwards from there. So I think there'd be some good advantages with that, that situation. All right, we're over a little bit today, but I thank you all for, for joining me. I'll send an email out later with resources.